Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Joe Power, and I'm going to be talking to you today about my book, Clare and the War of Independence. I'll be looking at various aspects of the war, the highlights of it and the lowlights of it, as much as possible. When the Great War ended in, on the 11th of November 1918, the people around the world rejoiced, and indeed in Ireland as well. But while the war was ending in one, in one area, the volunteers of Clare, and indeed all over Ireland, were preparing to launch another war, this time the War of Independence against the British. The, uh, the general election of 1918, of 11th of December 1918, gave the mandate to the uh, volunteers and to the IRA and Sinn Féin in Ireland to seek independence, to seek an independent Irish Republic. In that election, more than 70% of the Irish people voted in favour of an Irish Republic and for Sinn Féin policies. And uh, in early January, Sinn Féin met, uh, the MPs met at the Mansion House in Dublin, and there they declared an Irish Republic. That, therefore, was the political mandate for the rebellion which took place. But even before that, the volunteers were going to go ahead anyway, and uh, they were planning a new rebellion. The county inspector, the RIC county inspector, Mr. Gelston, reported, the volunteers are insufficiently armed and equipped for conflict with soldiers, and fears of the consequences restrains them from rebellion. It was indeed ironic that County Inspector Mr. Gelston said that the volunteers had not enough weapons to attack the British Army, as most of the war in Clare was conducted against the police and the Black and Tans. It was a David versus Goliath struggle. The volunteers had set up a new military structure in Clare. There were three brigades, East, Mid and West Clare, under Commandants Michael Brennan, Frank Barrett and Art O'Donnell. They had a secret, well-organised army, organised on military lines with three brigades, 17 battalions and almost 100 companies, with more than 6,000 volunteers on, the, on, on their books. The major problem, of course, was a shortage of weapons. This was a serious handicap to the whole war effort. In April, the Doyle announced the policy of boycotting the police, the RIC, as agents of the British government, and de Valera declared them to be enemies of Ireland, and called upon them to resign. They were to be ostracised, boycotted. They were, as de Valera called them, the janissaries of Ireland. Now there was a moral difficulty of attacking the RIC. They were Catholic. They come from rural, small farmer backgrounds. Most of them were of a similar background to most of the volunteers who were going to fight against them. And that was a difficulty. And to kill people that perhaps they, they, they knew of people that were, were, were associated with the RIC, and many people had family, had members in the RIC from rural Ireland. Uh, anyway, going back to the main problem of the shortage of weapons, this was a serious handicap. And therefore, the, the volunteers and the IRA set out to acquire weapons by whatever means. And the first thing was to attack the big houses, the gentry houses, usually the Protestant-owned houses. Many of them had been ex-British Army officers, and they had guns, and, uh, for, uh, and for various purposes, they also had guns for hunting and shooting and stuff like that. So they, there were some raids carried out, and they acquired a number of weapons, about 15 or 20, I suppose, in the spring of that year. So a couple of rifles and uh, some shotguns and some ammunition. Not an awful lot. Not enough to carry on a war against the heavily armed Crown forces in the county, in which you had maybe uh, more than 400 police, you had several hundred uh, British Army and, and also British Navy forces in the county. So they would need more than a dozen weapons or so to take on that force. Uh, they also, of course, carried on raids on, on police barracks and, and they ambushed uh, police patrols and tried to get weapons in that way. And they were reasonably successful. Anyway, the, on the 13th of April, the first attempt to disarm three policemen occurred at Nokera in uh, West Clare. And it was inspired by Ernie O'Malley, a leading uh, rep Republican officer in the Irish Army at the time. And uh, he encouraged the volunteers to try and 
ambushed or sur surrounds to rush the, uh, the, the, the policemen, three policemen who were watching the men parading on a Sunday. Now they were parading in their Sunday vests, all up in their Sunday mass suits. But nevertheless, then they rushed and tried to surround the police and tried to, and disarmed two of them. But uh, the sergeant held on to his weapon and fired a few shots. And Ernie O'Malley fired back at him. And I believe those are the first shots fired in the War of Independence in Clare, literally. Anyway, the operation failed, the guns were not secured, and Arthur O'Donnell and a few others ended up in jail in Limerick for six months. Anyway, this was, I suppose, the beginning of the war really started much, a little bit later than that, officially. According to Pierce Beasley, MP and Director of Publicity for the IRA, in a book published in 1926, he said, it was really in County Clare that the guerrilla warfare may be said to have started. And witness statements from local volunteers uh, indicate that the war started around the middle of the year. Andy O'Donoghue from Kilfenora, who was Commandant of the 5th Battalion mid Clare Brigade, stated in his witness statement, it was in June 1919 that the first meeting of the Brigade Council regarding operations, that it was decided that police patrols in the area should be attacked. They, of course, they, the first attack then took place on two constables at Kilfenora on the 7th of July. Shots were fired, wounding one of them, and uh, they didn't get any weapons that occasion, but it was denounced by the parish priests as cowardly midnight assassin, assassins. And in West Clare, around the 9th of July, constables were fired upon at Danganella and Cora Clare. And, uh, and then on the 20th of July, a new departure, the, the, again, Ernie O'Malley was involved and he claimed to have encouraged the volunteers to attack two police protection huts at Inch and Connolly. And uh, in, over, around midnight around that time, a, a party of about 15 or 20 volunteers in each case attacked them with shotguns and other, and other weapons, whatever. But again, they failed to capture any weapons or secure the, the capture of these protection huts. On the 3rd of August, the first attack on an RIC barracks took place in Broadford over in the East Clare Brigade, and they, so they were involved as well. Then there was a sensational uh, uh, event. On the 4th of August, there was a, um, two policemen were killed at a place called Ilon Bon, which is between Ina and Ennis Diamond on the back road there, and these policemen were on protection duty, protecting uh, people who were involved in some land disputes. And uh, two policemen were killed, Sergeant Reardon and Constable Murphy, by uh, three volunteers who attacked them. Uh, Sergeant Reardon died the next day, Constable Murphy was killed on the spot. But uh, the, the volunteers got their weapons. But there was holy murder after that, because the Bishop of Galway, Dr. O'Dee, he denounced it and he said it was drawing down God's curse and that the curse of Cain would fall on the people, on the perpetrators. And there were lurid headlines in the local papers, and especially in the Catholic press, saying the stain of blood, etc., etc. It was widely denounced. But despite the denunciations from the um, Bishop of Galway, because it was in his diocese, and also from other people, politicians and others, and some newspapers, it did not deter the volunteers. And uh, so the war went on. On the 5th of August, there was uh, literally two days later, or sorry, the next day after the Ilan Bon attack, the East Clare Brigade carried out a, a daring attack on the police RIC barracks at Newmarket. Commandant Michael Brennan led an arms raid on the barracks. Now, they had been assisted by one of the police, Constable Buckley. And Constable Buckley uh, more or less betrayed the barracks, let them in, and they secured six rifles, five revolvers, and hundreds of bullets, a significant coup for the uh, East Clare Brigade. Interestingly, Constable Buckley joined the IRA afterwards, and then he took part in the Civil War. These two sensational events, the killing of two policemen in Ilan Bon on the 3rd of August, sorry, 4th of August, and then the 5th of August, the next day, the raid on the barracks. The, the chief of police, the, the chief inspector, came down to County Clare and declared a proclamation of the county. All meetings were banned, under, the whole county was put under military rule, fairs and markets were banned, public gatherings were banned, Sinn Féin, Common Amman, Gaelic League, all these organisations were banned as well, and there were very strict uh, rules about moving around the county, and uh, you know, so the whole thing was, was, was serious. But anyway, it, this did not stop the IRA. 
they ignored the proclamation and they carried on their attacks in August, and attacking barracks in Tubber, Mayasta, Kilmehel, Quinn, Kilfenora, all over the county. They were, the IRA started to engage again, fighting against police patrols, but also attacking local barracks and police protection huts. The police responded by, by more or less consolidating their forces. They cut back the number of barracks and to shut down many police protection huts. They got extra weaponry. They uh, carried uh, very lights. They were told to carry dogs on patrol and keep dogs in the police barracks to alert them against attacks at night time, especially. They uh, also put barbed wire around the uh, police barracks and, and they had steel plated uh, over, over the windows and, and reinforced doors. So in that way, they made it more difficult to attack them. Anyway, uh, there was a sensational attack in a place called Sheshimore up in um, North Clare near Carron in which uh, there were some people, uh, gentlemen, let's say um, Henry Vincent McNamara of, Mac, uh, of, of um, Ennis Diamond, and you had Honourable Edward O'Brien of Ross Levin and Lady O'Brien, and they were attacked by a group of uh, volunteers trying to get the weapons off them. Now, they were going on a, on a shooting uh, that morning in Open Carron. But anyway, they, were, they, they fired back, and because of the aristocratic nature of the people involved, it, was, uh, it attracted notice in the British press and indeed the French press as well. So, uh, but they all fired back and the, the volunteers didn't secure the weapons. And one of the volunteers described uh, the, the Lady O'Brien as a formidable opponent, opponent as, as good as any of the men, and she, and she fired back at them. They were all injured, but no weapons were secured. Anyway, at the end of the year 1919, the Lord Chief Justice, Mr Maloney, he commented on the state of criminality in County Clare, and he said, Clare was much worse than any other county in, I in Munster. And uh, he lamented the moral situation in Clare and condemned it. He said, what is wrong with Clare? Well, the Bishop of Killaloo, Dr. Fogarty, he said, when I think of the people of Clare and see them defamed before the world by the hirelings of British tyranny as a race of moral degenerates, I am filled with indignation and cannot restrain my anger. It is an infamous falsehood. I will tell the world what is wrong with Clare. It is that they have the manliness to stand up against tyranny and to flourish the flag of Irish independence in the face of castle hacks, whether on or off the bench. Well, that was a powerful retort from the Bishop of Killaloo, an unlikely source, and which gave obviously a huge boost to the IRA in Clare and indeed to Sinn Féin and all over the country, indeed. Um, anyway, this was, that was in the end of 1919. Early in the new year, in 1920, the IRA started a new campaign, this time to undermine British uh, legal authority in the county. They set up Sinn Féin courts, which were pioneering in the, in the, in the whole country. And uh, they also encouraged the boycott of, of the uh, British court systems and also put pressure and intimidation on, on justices of the peace to resign their commissions. And they were very successful in that. And by, by, the, by the middle of the year, the, the main uh, British courts were being boycotted and many people were resorting to the Sinn Féin courts to get justice in, in that situation. Um, some of the early victims, IRA victims of the war, in, in January 1920, uh, uh, the first victim was Michael Darcy of Cora Clare, who was drowned while running away from, uh, after a, an attack on the police. He was drowned in the local river. And then on the 18th of February, Martin Devitt was killed in action near Fermoyle. It was a huge loss. He was the vice OC of the Mid Clare Brigade. And uh, interestingly, the parish priest, Father Nestor, the parish priest of Ennis Diamond, would not allow the coffin into the church of Ennis Diamond. And so the body had to be placed, and the coffin was placed in the workhouse chapel instead. But that didn't stop the volunteers from turning up in huge numbers to offer their sympathies. And um, on the fourth anniversary of the Easter Rising, on the 3rd of April, there was a huge bonfire of abandoned RIC barracks and police huts all over the county. More than 20 of them were burnt. And that was more or less saying uh, to, the, to the government and to the Crown Forces, you know, we're still here and we're going to, the fight goes on and in memory of the men of 1916. The 14th of April, there was a terrible tragedy above in Milltown, a Canada Cross. During celebrations following an end of a hunger strike at Mount Joy, a strike which was led by Padder Clancy from, from, from Cranny and the release of the prisoners, three civilians were shot dead, controversially by the police and military, 
and several others wounded. Now that led to a huge change in the attitude of the people against the Crown forces in the Milltown overall region there. Um, three days later, there was a shocking sectarian attack which took place because the Protestant church in Clare Castle was burnt to the ground by some, some people who obviously had the sectarian motives. Um, the next day, the, there was the, the, what was called the Battle of Kilnehill, in which uh, the IRA attacked a police uh, who were returning from, from Mass uh, on a Sunday, and uh, one sergeant, Sergeant Carroll, was killed, and a volunteer, John Breen, was also killed. So there were two casualties in that incident. So in that one week alone, you had the 14th of April, they had the massacre of Canada Cross, the 17th of April, the sectarian attack, burning of the church in Clare Castle, and the 18th the Battle of Kilmahill, there was a huge amount of events taking place in that county, controversial and uh, certainly uh, was, they, were, they, they were obviously creating sensational events in the county. On the 23rd of June, on the eve of the Fan Spansel Hill Fair, the Mid Clare Brigade under Joe Barrett carried, carried out a very daring um, attack or ambush on the uh, a platoon, or a, there were not platoon, yeah, but there were six or seven British soldiers who were marching back to the barracks, home barracks in Ennis, in Ennis. and they, they were surrounded by a group of about 20 men and disarmed and uh, they were locked up in, in Jack Darcy's yard and in Ennis and this, this was near O'Connell Street, Ennis. And, uh, it was a, and, and they got away with seven rifles and uh, a considerable amount of ammunition, a, a very daring and very significant coup. Meanwhile, Overseas, the publicity was getting a, a, a notice, and even um, in, in India, there was a Joe Hawes of Tubber. Um, he, he, for instance, was in the Connacht Rangers. He fought in World War I and then joined the British Army after that, and he was sent off to India in 1919. Uh, but he came home on holidays, and he saw the way the IRA are, were being treated, and he saw the way the uh, Crown Forces, the Black and Tans and police, were treating the people and he complained about it, and he set off what was known as the Connacht Rangers Mutiny over in India. Uh, he and 14 others were sentenced to death, but one man was, was ex executed, was James Daly, and the others were sentenced to life in prison. And there was, they, he, he was in prison for nearly five years, and, and um, sorry, sorry, uh, three years. But anyway, he was finally released after the treaty, and uh, he came back to Kilrush in 1923. Um, so, uh, the, the events therefore were getting noticed all over the country and all over the world. Uh, in between June and July, then you had the formation of the flying columns. There were active service brigades in each in each area. This was sort of a spontaneous development, and they had about between I suppose 20, 25 men, who each of them was armed with a rifle and ammunition, maybe 25, 20, 25 rounds of ammunition, and they had of course their usual daily rations of cigarettes and food and whatever they were, they were given. And they were well tugged out with uniforms and leggings and boots. And they were the people who were going to carry on the, the new strategy, hit and run tactics. And they were the ones uh, who carried out most of the attacks over the next year or so. Um, so the next event, I suppose, in the, towards the end of the year, uh, on September, 22nd of September, um, the famous Renine ambush. This was carried out by the 4th Battalion of the Midclare Brigade and they killed uh, six RIC men. They captured six rifles, six revolvers and about a thousand rounds of ammunition. But following that, there were extensive reprisals in Ennestymon, Lehinch and Milton Malbe, which I suppose about 27 houses were wrecked and six civilians were killed directly or indirectly by in, in those repri reprisals. And um, they were carried out by what the British called an anti Sinn Féin gang. They were made up of black and tens and auxiliaries and some military. They were Protestant, urban, English instead of the Irish Catholic, rural RIC policemen. They were an alien force. The new black and tens that were coming to Ireland. Um, they came in, in the middle of June or uh, middle of 1920. Many, many old RIC men had resigned and retired early and they had to be replaced. And many of the new recruits, most of them in fact, came from England. They were a totally different stock to the Irish Catholic rural farming background people who made up the old RIC. And these people were paid uh, 10 shillings a day 
And whereas a new, also elite group called the Auxiliaries, ex-officers, they were paid one pound a day. And they were based over the lakeside in Killaloo. And also on the 22nd of September, the Captain Lendrum was killed at, in Dunbeg. And uh, this also started off a reign of terror in, uh, in extensive reprisals in West Clare. Um, meanwhile, over in East Clare, the, the, RIC, the, the uh, local brigade, the East Clare Brigade, were carrying out attacks in barracks at Scarif, Broadford, Fecal, and O'Brien's Bridge. And they killed uh, about five policemen in, in, in between around that time of the year. There was a sensational arms raid in Rouen in, in 19, uh, towards the 18th of October 1920, and Rouen barracks was captured. This time, sensationally, they captured 14 rifles, 14 revolvers, two shotguns, 24 bombs, and 14 bicycles, and several thousand rounds of ammunition. Again, this was an insider job. They got help from a, a constable, Bill Carroll who told them that the, the, where, where the Achilles heel of the, of the, of, of the, of the barracks was, and uh, they went in there. Now, one constable re resisted, Constable Lockheed, and he was shot and killed. But all the rest were, were just disarmed, and uh, they were let go afterwards. Uh, they were, well, they were tied up, but they were, they were later released. Uh, so, that was on the 18th of October, and that was a huge shock and a huge boost for the uh, IRA of Midclare, who suddenly got uh, 28 weapons, 14 rifles and uh, 14 revolvers, and shotguns and bombs, etc. So, um, now there was, a, obviously there was always an issue going to be about people who might have been, seemed to be spies and stuff like that, or informers. And uh, on the 26th of October, the first spy to be shot in Clare was a man named Martin Coonahan, a Coolay Bog, near Fecal. And, but sadly and tragically, the execution was botched and he wasn't efficiently killed. And uh, he staggered about two or three miles into, Bodai, into a pub in Bodaik and he died there after getting some medical treatment and also being seen by the local priest, etc. That was, that was, you know, if you think about it, if you're going to kill someone, you should do it efficiently. And it wasn't done efficiently. But then again, I suppose the, the, um, the men who carried out the operation were, they were unskilled in that, in that department. They weren't that used to killing anybody, perhaps. Maybe it was their first time. On the 17th of November, there was a murder at Killaloo Bridge of three volunteers, Martin Gilday, Alfie Rogers, and Michael McMahon, and their civilian care caretaker of a house, Michael Egan. They were arrested at a house called Williamstown and uh, they were held on the bridge, tied arms and feet, and then shot while trying to run away. It was absolutely outrageous, nothing but murder. And on the 21st of November, on Bloody Sunday in Dublin, two Clare men were killed. One was uh, Padder Clancy, who was Vice Commandant of the um, Dublin Brigade, and Conor Clune, a civilian who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Both of them were arrested on the night before Bloody Sunday, and both of them were bludgeoned to death shot and killed on, on the evening of Bloody Sunday. And um, on the 4th of, of December, there was even an attempt to murder uh, Bishop Fogarty by Crown agents, and who set out to kill this man, because the bishop was such a thorn in the side of the British establishment, and he was condemning uh, the Crown atrocities, and they wanted to get rid of him. And uh, lucky enough, he wasn't at home that evening, when four uh, men uh, in disguise, faces blackened, etc., turned up and inquired about his whereabouts. In fact, he'd gone to Dublin on a mission, a mission of peace, because there was a, an Archbishop Patrick Clune of Perth. He was from Rouen, County Clare, and he was visiting Ireland at this time. And the British decided to use him as an intermediary to try and bring out a truce or peace of some kind. So Archbishop uh, Clune and Dr. Fogarty went to Dublin and um, they went over then to London on at least four times. Well, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Clune went to London at least four times and met uh, the Lloyd George and the British establishment and they tried to negotiate a, a truce. But uh, unfortunately, the British insisted that the IRA would hand up their weapons and that was not going to happen. And sadly, it was an opportunity for peace, and um, it, it failed. And ironically, six months later, the, when, the British, when the truce was agreed, the British did not insist on the surrender of their weapons of the IRA. Anyway, Lloyd George, on one occasion, described the, the volunteers as murderers, and uh, Dr. Clune said, 
No, sir. They are the cream of their race. And this, this, this was a, a famous expression which, again, made headlines around the world. The volunteers were the cream of the Irish race. And uh, it was a lost opportunity for peace. And uh, Dr. Clune also countered uh, British propaganda at the Vatican and giving the Pope first-hand information of the situation in Ireland. Following the collapse of these negotiations in, 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 in because of the British uh, in, insistence on the IRA surrendering their weapons, the British decided on a new, tougher policy towards Ireland, where the, um, the military were going to try and win this battle. Martial law was introduced in County Clare on the 8th of January, and, uh, but this did not stop the uh, volunteers in Clare. On the 13th of January, the East Clare Battalion attacked uh, uh, RIC um, lorry at Cratlow, and they got killed two RIC men and captured four rifles and ammunition. On the 20th of January, uh, literally a week later, there was another big ambush, this time at Glenwood in East Clare, carried out by the East Clare Brigade, and they, this time they killed uh, six RIC, and including two black and tans, and again captured a significant amount of weapons and, and ammunition. Following these, of course, there were extensive reprisals in places like Cratlow, Six Mile Bridge, all that region of East Clare, and at least 18 houses were burnt and people were beaten up, etc. Also around this time, the IRA began a war, a new, a new tactic, a war on communications all over Clare. They started digging trenches across roads, blowing up bridges, damaging the railway network, and cutting down tele telegraph and telephone wires. And they seriously hampered communications all over the county. They also had train robberies. These, these tactics were very, very effective. And by literally, by June, the, the, the county uh, inspector was, was admitting that the IRA, were by these tactics, were seriously hampering Crown Forces movement around the county. And they were really were confined to going around in large convoys. And they, at many occasions, they, they, they forced people at gunpoint. They called into Ennis or many other towns around the county, arrested people, picked them up, brought them to fix, repair trenches and roads or fix bridges. I, I know a case in, in my, own, my own father was, was arrested in, in, down in Cloud Castle and forced, he and many other young men were forced to repair the bridge at Latoon, which had been blown up, blown up by the IRA in, in June 1920. So, uh, sorry, 21. Anyway, they also, the IRA also carried out economic warfare and they, they, they seized the rate, rate books of the county council and also they, they, they took the money from the rate payer, from the rate collectors. And um, the Crown responded, of course, more reprisals, or another ban on fairs and markets. Would you believe it? In June 1920, they even put a ban on bicycles. You could be shot if you were seen cycling away in, in a bicycle. It's extraordinary. I mean, this, this ban had a huge impact on, on social life all over the county. It was very, very serious. And uh, over the next few weeks or so, a few months or so, uh, there were random attacks on police, etc. The, the police, there were three British soldiers were killed over in East Clare by the East Clare Brigade. They were alleged to be spies. And a policeman was also, Constable Murphy was shot in the Six Mile Bridge area as a spy. In Newmarket, a man called John Riley, an ex soldier, was shot as a spy on the 21st of April. And interesting enough, the local parish priest, Canon O'D, had been identified by Michael Collins, who was director of intelligence for the IRA, as a, as a, 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 as a spy. And uh, the trouble was, could the IRA go and execute Canon O'D, the parish priest? That was a difficult one. Um, on the 16th of April, there was a terrorist-style attack on Cato Shocknessy's pub in Ennis, in Market Street, Ennis, and uh, killed Sergeant Rue. The IRA volunteers to threw a Mills, uh, a Mills bomb into the shop first, and then followed in with guns blazing. But they also injured two other two customers, uh, the proprietor, Cato Shocknessy, and another woman as well, who were in the pub at the time. Um, in response, of course, British again in, imposed curfews, more uh, bans on f all fairs, even the, the famous uh, the fair of Spencer Hill was banned uh, for, for nearly a month. And um, for the first time, there was, in, in uh, 24th of April, there was the, the combined attack. The, the, uh, 
the army executive in Dublin wanted more co cooperation between the different brigades. And for the first time, the East Clare Brigade combined with the West Clare Brigade for an attack on Kilrush on the 24th of April, around that time, and about a total of 45 men were involved, and they killed a sergeant and wounded several other uh, British either soldiers or sailors in, in Kilrush on that occasion. This was the first time, and it, but of course in response, the usual reprisals, the Kilrush Town Hall was burnt, the Maid of Erin was pulled down by the, by, by the uh, Black and Tans a few days later. So again, significant. Um, Another execution, a controversial execution, uh, occurred on the 16th of June, this time Patrick Darcy, uh, a national teacher of Dunbeg, alleged to be a spy, and uh, that is still a matter of controversy. And uh, his last words, um, uh, as reported by one of the people who was at the execution, said, I forgive you boys, but you're shooting me in the wrong. And um, again, that is a matter of still of controversy. So. Anyway, um, also around this time, in, seven, in June, uh, there were four uh, volunteers of the East Clare Brigade who were killed in action. One was a Carrigorn, was Tom Healy, who was actually had resigned from the police in Ennis the day before, and literally in his first operation with the IRA, he died on, on, on literally on all day, an action which took place all day. And two were killed at Cratlow, an ambush on the 16th of June, Christopher McCarthy and Michael Gleeson. And then Captain Patrick White, who was a prisoner at Spike Island, was shot by one of the, uh, one of the police in, 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 in Spike Island. So, um, the last Clare policeman to be killed in Clare was a constable Needham from Tier McLean Barracks, who was shot in Ennis on the 8th of July. And on the day of the truce, another Clare pl policeman was killed. This time he was killed in Roscommon. He was Constable James King, who was born in County Clare, but was, was stationed in Roscommon. And that was the end. He was probably the last RIC victim of the, of, of the War of Independence. As the war ended, it, you know, it, it, certain things uh, come to mind. One is the significant role of the Catholic Church, led by the, the bishop, Dr. Fogarty. Uh, but in addition to him, there were many other priests who were, uh, who, who were supporters of the IRA. You had Father Pat Gaynor of Mullock, who was jailed for six months. Father M Michael McKenna, also a curate in Mullock, another six months jail. Uh, Canon, uh, o Kennedy of St. Thanos College was jailed for six months. Uh, other priests had their houses uh, wrecked. Uh, Father John Kennedy of Kilanina was assaulted and the vessels were, were, were torn, or sacred uh, vessels were, were, were also damaged. And uh, so you had a lot of intimidation of the clergy and who gave great support. Uh, Dr. Fogarty, Bishop of Killaloo, had a huge inf influence on, on, on the rebellion. Uh, he sympathised with the 1916 rebels and admired their courage. He was pro de Valera after the 1917 election as a man sent by God. And he said Sinn Féin arose and drove the English rust from the soul of Ireland. He publicly condemned the ill treatment of the Mount Joy hunger strikers and the death of Thomas Ashe in 1917. He led the anti-conscription protests in 1918, and that the 19 election, 18 election gave moral sanction to the armed struggle for independence. He was a, a turbulent priest, and no wonder sinister forces in the British establishment wanted to get rid of him. Uh, also important, of course, was the role of common man. We cannot ignore the vital role that the women played in this conflict. They were not allowed to carry weapons, or sorry, to, to uh, engage in, in warfare. They were, they were not part of the volunteers as such. But they gave a huge backup to the volunteers. They, they provided many, many services. They, for instance, safe houses. They, they ca secretly carried weapons. They carried communications. They engaged in intelligence gathering. They, they nursed the wounded and looked after the sick. And so therefore, a vital and valuable support was, was, was played by the, the women of the common man. And they, they were like the men, they were, they were organized into three brigades, and uh, there were something like uh, 1,500 members of common man in, in, on when the truce was announced on the 11th of July. So there was a huge amount of women all over Clare in each brigade who were involved in this campaign. And uh, the, you can see they were, they, they, they were significant. Anyway, the truce came and quite simply it was because um, the IRA were running short of ammunition, there's no doubt about that, and, and the testament of people like Michael Brennan, but even Dan Breen, the famous Tipperary man, also said the same thing. 
and 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 you know the point was the IRA were not defeated in 19 in 1921 when the truce came they could have carried on they could have carried on the war for goodness knows many many years afterwards but they were they would probably never have defeated the the British crown forces who were largely control the towns it would be fair to say I think that the IRA controlled the countryside and most of the volunteers were from the countryside the the roads and communications were paralyzed the legal system was, was, was undermined. There was, the war was fought on many fronts. It was fought on economic warfare, military warfare. There was propaganda warfare. It was also uh, economic and psychological. So therefore, the IRA, with a very limited arsenal, took on and they didn't defeat the Crown forces, but they reached a stalemate and a truce. They forced them to a stalemate and a truce, and that was hugely significant. And um, that was their greatest achievement. It was, after all, a David and Goliath struggle. And uh, we've always seen David can sometimes beat Goliath by many other means, besides uh, direct uh, warfare and overwhelming forces. And the British did not defeat the IRA. And so the truce was called. And uh, of course, also must be a factor as well that the British had secured, at that stage, the partition of Ireland. And Stormont was opened in June 1921. And significantly, very shortly afterwards, the British agreed to a truce. They had appeased the Unionists, but of course, partitioned Ireland. And uh, that's another story. Thank you for listening to me.